locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Pro wrestling is at its best. I mean, when, when it is absolutely firing on all cylinders, it's not difficult to understand what's going on there. You know, the, you as the audience don't have to work too hard to figure out who are the people that we want to cheer, who are the people that we're booing, who are the bad girls and guys, who are the good girls and guys. It just it's clearly defined. And i got to tell you something. While superheroes over the past two seasons, has done such a great job. And i got to commend you know, folks like David McClain and, and also Jeannie Buss for building a roster of stars who the fans don't have to think too hard about who the good girls and who the bad girls are. I mean, we definitely know what's going on here, folks. This week, I have somebody who is just, she's taking the whole wrestling world by storm because she is just, so cool, number one. She is so easy to root for, number two. And on top of that, that it actually is who she is. She's really a good person. So, without further ado, welcome to the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast, Steffi Slade. How are you, Steffi? I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. And, and listen, I got to tell you, WOW Superheroes has really turned into what I like to call apartment television. I mean, you, you legitimately have to set your DVR or you have to make sure that you're home because when we have stars like Steffi Slays on TV, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's an event. Talk to us about uh, what's going on here at, in Wild Superheroes for Season 2. Because last season, you were the rookie. You were just starting off, and I know that a couple of people were giving you a hard time and what have you because you were the new girl on the block. Has any of that changed for you in season two? Are, are, are you starting to get a little bit more respect from the folks in the locker room? Um, yeah, well, honestly, that's something that I just don't really know, to be honest. I mean, I'm hoping that people are starting to realize my skills and my strength in the wrestling ring. Uh, but, you know, I feel like in this kind of industry, you're always going to have people who want to take you down no matter what the reasons are. Um, and there's definitely a lot of people still in the past who are still trying to take me down. For example, Emily Maverick, she's one of them. Um, and then there's definitely going to be new people e- coming in my way trying to take me down as well. So it's never a en- never ending story with that. <laughs> I guess from my perspective is to just keep going and to keep pushing through and just to show them that I do belong just as much as they do, and I will make it to the top eventually. You know, and I'm glad you mentioned her name. This this, this Abilene Maverick, the, the governor's daughter, I, I know that she has a lot of experience in the wrestling world, and for some reason, it's like she's just she's fixated on Steffi Slays. It's almost as if she's dedicating her time in WoW Superheroes to make your time as, as uncomfortable as possible. Dare I say, she's a bully. Well, what do you think her problem really is with you? Um, I honestly don't really know what she truly has against me. Um, there are times where I think it's because, you know, we're both from Texas or because I'm very, very young, um, coming into the industry at age 17. Um, I really don't know what her problem is. Maybe she just sees me as somebody who's not capable to have the amount of strength that I do in the ring. And, I mean, you know, you would look at me when I first came in, a 17-year-old who, yeah, maybe in the time I didn't know what I was walking into, and I probably did look weak. I would admit I personally thought I looked weak. So for them, it was just an easy target to scare away because, of course, the less opponents you have, the higher chance you're going to get to reaching the top. So definitely she saw me as an opportunity to try to take down and unfortunately, it's not going to be an easy fight for her. <laughs> well, it, it sure isn't because you, you've done a great job of holding your own there. And it's funny because here in Season 2, you aligned yourself with another person who knows how to deal with bullies. And we're talking about Kita Rush. Not only does she have the, the Bully Busters gym, but you and Kita have put together 
together a great tag team known as the Bully Busters. Talk to us about this relationship that you and Keita have in, in, in this Bully Busters tag team. Yeah, definitely. So, like you mentioned, she has the gym for bully busting. Um, she comes from a bullying experience background as well. Hers was more of a physical type of bullying. People broke her ribs and then popped out her shoulder, broke a lot of things physically. And compared to me, where I was mentally broken and emotionally broken, so we both agree that that's equally the same because bullying is bullying. And whenever you are going through depression or some kind of hurt or, you know, brokenness, it's all the same no matter what, if whether it's mentally or physically. And we decided to come together. Um, and in that time when we did decide, I was still in high school and I was still getting bullied. And, of course, she saw that I was getting bullied as well as well. So... She saw that as an opportunity to approach me and say, hey, I've been through what you've gone through and, you know, I kind of want to give you advice and show you how to become a better person and to ignore all those voices and to prove yourself physically that you can do this and be here. Um, she is a few years older than me, so for her it was more of like a mentor, mentor situation to help me out. And, of course, she has a great heart and we're great friends. Um, who share the same experience. So that's really, it was, it was an easy, easy matchup for both of us to say, hey, let's get together, let's become a tag team, and let's see how far we can do this together and hopefully get the belt. <laughs> well, and, and, and you said that right. I mean, definitely, it's, it's fun because season one, Steffi Slays had a lot of support from the fans right from the beginning. I mean, it was it was very obvious that they could feel your positive energy, and they were feeding off of that, and, and that's why they were rooting for you so hard. Even in the beginning, when you had a little bit of a losing streak, it, it was it was almost as if because they saw you fight so hard and never give up, that made them want to support you more. So to see you and Keep the Rush combine and have this Bully Busters tag team here in season two. I'm seeing signs in the crowd that say Bully Busters and, 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 you know, young and old, everyone's jumping up and down. They can't get enough of you two. So so you said it just now. Are, are you focused on the WOW Tag Team Championships? Is that a goal for you that you both have set there? Um, yes, definitely. That is uh, the ultimate goal is to definitely get the gold. <laughs> um but our but in the process of doing that, you know, we want to challenge ourselves. We want to push ourselves. Um, no matter what the results are, we have to be um, we have to be happy with with how far we've grown because you know it is a self growing challenge as well. You know that that's a personal battle that you have to overcome every single day. You know you there's there's not going to be a lot of victories and you got to be able to accept that. You got to be able to say okay yes I did lose this time around. But that's not going to stop me. I'm not going to let this define me. I got to keep fighting. I got to keep going. And it takes a lot of passion and determination to have that kind of mindset. And you have to be strong. And for me, dealing with, you know, a mental problem, for me, that's my actual personal goal is to not let the negativity and the disappointment stop me from doing what I love. And I truly love the sport. And I just got to keep pushing myself and keep going. Yes, I would love to have the belt and so would Kita, but overall is our health and happiness and strength for ourselves. We're talking to Steffi Slays of WOW Superheroes, and once again, Access TV, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, every Saturday night, folks. Definitely got to check it out. See some of the best wrestling action that you will see from around the world there. Now, talk to us about something here, Steffi, because your in-ring style, is 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 just really really good. I mean, it's clear that you've been trained properly there. You know when it's time to go to the mat. You know when it's time to to jump up on the turnbuckle and do some flying moves and what have you. How did you prepare yourself for this? Because I'm sure you were a big time athlete in school and growing up and what have you. And and you're still in great shape. How did you prepare to actually step into the ring? Um, that's a funny story because honestly, I have never been athletic in my past at any point. I've never played sports. 
Um, the most I've ever done was PE, which that doesn't really count. <laughs> um, but no, when I first started wrestling, it was more, I found it by accident. Um, Sofia Lopez, who is the attorney for WOW, is actually a great friend of my mom, and she saw that I have reached rock bottom in my life to the point where I literally was spent every single day in bed and I would not get up for anything. I completely lost myself. I was in a really, really dark place to the point where I felt like I no longer wanted to live because that's how badly it affected me mentally with the bullying. Um, just people telling me that I can't do it, that, you know, people telling me that I don't belong here. Uh, why do you even exist? Like, you shouldn't even, you shouldn't even be here. So hearing that over and over and over again by multiple people, I just felt like maybe they're right. Maybe I don't belong here and nobody loves me, nobody cares for me. So why should I care for myself and love myself? Um, so Sophia, she recommended me to start doing something physical with myself to help myself get out of depression and start bringing positivity and, and life back into me. And it has been one of the greatest advice and recommendation I have ever taken and actually fought through with. I actually decided to go to the training center, and that's where I met Selena Majors, and it took just one day of training for me to completely fall in love with wrestling and since then, my life has changed. I felt a flame, a uh, just fire underneath me, and definitely life did come back. I felt like there, I had a reason to live again, um, pure happiness and joy, and I just wanted it so badly. Um, it's a feeling that I just can't explain, but it's. It, I love the feeling that wrestling gave me. It just definitely gave me life again, and. I, I was a, I was a little 17 year old who had a spaghetti body, <laughs> very very unflexible, unstrung, just noodly, <laughs> and it was definitely one of the hardest and longest journey I have ever taken um, to become any kind of athlete. Like I didn't know what a diet was. I didn't know how to work out properly. But thank God I had Selena Major there as my coach and trainer to push me through. And it wasn't easy. I had multiple, multiple breakdowns in the middle of the ring in front of Selena. I would start crying and telling her, I don't belong here. You know what? I'm, I'm a complete loser. This is not for me. Uh, you're putting your hope in, in something that's never going to happen. And, wow, she has never let me down. She would not take any of that for an answer. She said, you are worthy. You belong here. You deserve this kind of lifestyle. You deserve to have a great life. And I'm going to make sure that you accomplish this life um, of pure happiness and joy. And she did. She helped me get through it. And, you know, of course, I'm still with me. I'm still constantly going to training. My life is very, very packed. I go to school from 7 to 1.30 every single day, and then I go straight to Selena and train with her from 3 to midnight, and that's just pretty much my life, <laughs> wow. being in the ring. Yes. That is, <laughs> that is a, a stacked schedule, and that's a heck of a story there. In fact, you, you know, we had Selena Majors here on the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast uh, right before Season 2 of WOW Superheroes on Access TV began. And I remember Selena Majors uh, growing up. I mean, she is a tough customer. She was she was Bambi uh, when she first started off in the wrestling business. And, and folks, let me tell you, do your research. Uh, Selena Majors is a tough customer, knows what she's doing out there. And the fact that she can take Steffi Slade, somebody who just said she never really played sports, didn't have an athletic background, and turn her into a, a literal star, in a major pro wrestling company, that that is just tremendous. And also, I, I got to say this: Sophia Lopez, she, she's the world's greatest attorney. She's the greatest attorney in the universe. 
Uh, she's already threatened to sue me if I don't say positive things about her, so I just got to make sure I slide that in there as well. I don't want any problems from Sofia Lopez. That's right. <laughs> so, wow, so you didn't, you didn't have an athletic background. What are the things that you're in? You, you say that you, you go to school. What are you studying in school? Um, actually, I'm at school right now, so definitely I'm going towards the OBGYN department. And easy wording, it's pretty much pregnancies and the mommy female department. <laughs> so definitely i huge on, you know, providing care and love for people who need it. And it's something that I love doing. I just love helping out others and trying to find ways to solve a problem if there is a problem. If, and if not, definitely the pure joy of life. So that's, that's something that I'm I love to be a part of and what I'm studying to do and just can't wait to start. Um, hopefully in the next summer I'll start my externship and be able to be around that environment as well. And it's not going to stop me from wrestling. Nothing's going to stop me from wrestling. But at the same time, I want to be able to achieve other goals and dreams, and that's definitely one of them. I work so hard, uh, spent so many years in school. I literally dedicate my life to my family my school, and my wrestling. That's all I live for right now. <laughs> wow. And, and so, listen, Abilene Maverick, the governor's daughter, I hope you're listening here because Steffi Slays, after she, she busts you up in the ring, you know, she's going to give you some love and care. She'll pat you back up. Uh, you know, she, she, can, she can break it and then fix it. So you, you keep it up, and we're going to get Steffi Slays, the wrestler, and the the medical professional will take care of you. That's right. Oh That's right. yes. No, no. You gotta be careful because we have only a limited amount of hospitals here in Texas. So if you get on my bad side, I might not want to fix you, Abilene Maverick. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to us about something here because correct me if I'm wrong, but but you're Latina, right? Yes, I am. Okay. So this is this is really really interesting and and. and Follow me here on this. I, I'm older than you, and I can remember being a young person and, and watching TV, prime time, which we call prime time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, folks. I can remember watching prime time TV, and it was very rare to see a woman of color, a Latina woman, a, you know, a, a black and Asian woman, a woman of color on TV starring in a series and she's in a strong leadership role, presented in a positive way. It was very rare to see that on primetime TV uh, for me growing up. Fast forward now to 2019, and we have someone like Steffi Slade, a Latina woman who's strong. She's standing up to bullies. She's setting goals, and she's achieving it, and she's doing it without compromising her morals. She is, she is an inspiration for others to look up to and follow. How does it feel to know that you have young people, including young Latina girls, watching you on primetime TV and saying to themselves, wow, maybe one day I can be Steffi Slaves? Oh, yeah. Honestly, I still don't know how to express that kind of feeling. Like you mentioned, um, you, for example, growing up, not really seeing people like me on primetime television hour. Um, I can only imagine what it was like to live in a time like that. I had never experienced anything like that. Um, so to hear you and my grandma, my mom, you know, other people telling me the same thing, you know, you should feel so proud of yourself to be on primetime as a color woman. Um, it's just such a humbling feeling and, and I sometimes get very emotional about it because all, I can only experience it through the way how you tell the story and the way how you look at me while telling, telling me the story. Um, I don't have you in front of me, but I could just feel it. I could feel the emotion and, and the, your feeling towards, you know, from your voice. Um, so it's definitely such a great honor to know that people from the past had worked so hard to come to this point so that people like I can be represented in a positive positive light in front of millions of people on national TV on prime time. And 
Um, the one thing that my grandma would tell me all the time is that she worked so hard for her, throughout her whole entire life just so I can have the ability to walk my life in such a pure light. And my goal is to hopefully live up to that standard as well so that people from the younger generation can see me and see that, wow, she's doing all of this stuff. Um, and she has, she has problems as well, but she's not allowing her problems to overcome her life anymore. She's allowing pure joy and love to run her life and, and to chase the dreams. And I definitely hope that I'm doing such a great job to encourage, you know, people from the younger generation, even in the older generation. There's a lot of adults who are lost and don't know who they are. And hopefully my story can touch them. And, and they can relate and realize, wow, that's the same situation I'm in. And if she can get out of it, so can I. Um, and it takes it to the next level to be Latina. Uh, because a lot of people throughout my whole life would tell me that I would never be able to do it. You don't have the ability to, to make it this far. And here I am hustling and pushing through and not allowing any of those people define me anymore like they did in the past. I'm defining myself, and I'm standing up for who I am. And being Latina is definitely um, one of the main things, you know. Um, this month has been filled with amazing news for myself and my family. Um, it is the month of the Latin heritage um, community right now, so a celebration of all Latin all over America and, and the Latin countries. Um, I guess one of the biggest things that I'm very proud of is my grandmother. She is 82 years old, and she finally, after being in America all of my life, I'm in my 20s, she's been in America longer than my life, and after all these years, she finally became an American citizen. And to have her here with me, and to have her experience everything that I'm doing with me, and to see me on television is such a great honor and I just I get a little bit emotional about this stuff because like you said this is things that people would never imagine to come to and here she is an American citizen at an older age but you know she's here and she's seeing her granddaughter on prime time television and it's just a beautiful experience to go through what a tremendous family <laughs> story there oh my goodness Definitely shout out to the whole family, the, your siblings and, and parents, aunts, uncles, and shout out to grandma becoming an American citizen at 82 years old. That That is unbelievable. Wow. No, no wonder you're so motivated and, and you get it done out there so well. You, you, you come from some, some great family there. Yes, I do it all for them. <laughs> that is That is impressive. That is impressive. So, so tell everybody, uh, uh, what can we expect? from Steffi Slays, from the Bully Busters. What are we going to get in season two of WoW Superheroes? Because you're just you're so motivated and, and you're so uh, focused on accomplishing goals. What are the main things we're going to see in season two? Definitely you're going to see a lot of improvement from Kita and Steffi. We are up for the challenge. We're taking bigger opponents, quote-unquote stronger opponents, but they don't know the strength that we're going to bring to the ring. And no matter what, we are going to be who we say we are. We are the bully busters, and we're not going to let anybody stand in between us and tell us that we are not worthy to be in the ring, and we're going to prove them wrong. And whether we take victories or not, we're going to show them who we are and do our best in the ring. Yeah, and I'll tell you right now, folks, if you've been paying attention, they sure have been. The the bully busters are taking wild superheroes by storm. Steffi, if, if the fans want to follow you on social media, let, let them know. Where can they go? Because I, I know one thing that you do, you definitely pop up during Wild Superheroes, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Access TV, every Saturday. Uh, a lot of times you respond to, to folks who are watching along the show and, and, and retweet, and, and there's just this great interaction, this great connection that you have with the fans. How do we keep that train going for folks who haven't connected with you yet? Where can they find you on social media? Yes, definitely. I have my Instagram and Twitter at the same name, 
wow underscore Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E. And like you mentioned, I love talking with people. So please tag me, comment, show me everything about wow, and I would love to chat with you. I mean, I, I really enjoyed that interview with Steffi Slay. She's just a, a, a really cool person, very hardworking, and you can catch her as we said, folks, every Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on WOW Superheroes. Just, you know, real nice girl. She She's working hard, both in pro wrestling and she's in the medical field. Has a real nice family, good head on her shoulders. And she's hanging out with Keita Rush, you know, the Bully Busters. It's the name of their tag team. And as you heard, they got some goals there. And they plan on accomplishing those goals. So, good stuff there. And shout out to the whole WOW crew. Once again, folks, I, I just I love this this series that we have going on where we're shining a light on women's wrestling and and really we're we're shining a light on strong women in general. Okay, that's what it's all about here. Let's assist folks in, in, in being in a position to tell their stories and tell their stories in a manner that you, you won't hear elsewhere. Okay, I mean the fact that someone like Steffi Slay, she she got into the the idea of of being a woman of color, a Latina, on primetime television when it wasn't too long ago where that was very rare to see, and now you have an entire promotion of Wild Superheroes where you can see that every week. It's just tremendous, and even talking about her family, her 82 year old grandmother just became an American citizen. That's awesome. So it just, you know, really enjoyed that interview and and can't wait to speak to Steffi Slays again in the future and see where she's going to go from here. You know, that's the best part. That's that's pretty cool. So welcome back to Duke Loves Wrestling, everybody. You know, this is just (laughs) I'm on cloud nine. I have to tell you, I am on cloud nine. This has just been a tremendous, tremendous season for pro wrestling and boxing and and mixed martial arts i just it's every single day there's something going on and and every single day it's just quality stuff and we're going to definitely cover some of this stuff this week i have a special guest in in susan singari who you know i'll tell you right now she's one of the people that i go to for my my mma news but there's a lot more to her than just that she's an emmy award-winning journalist and you could definitely hear her story real soon i'm also going to discuss what's been happening this week in pro wrestling specifically the wednesday night war between wwe nxt and all elite wrestling you know they have their new show dynamite a lot of folks want to hear what i have to say about this and and i'm not going to disappoint in fact you'll have to stay tuned because i'm going to end the show with that so let me not waste any time because I have a lot to go over. Let's get our friend Susan Singari on the line. Folks, you're going to enjoy this. Here we go. Folks, as you know, I am a person that is extremely passionate about mixed martial arts. I mean, I just, I, I love MMA. I've been watching it since I was a kid. And, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have legends such as Dan the Beast Severin and, and Ken Shamrock on the show. Just really cool stuff. One of the questions that I get often from listeners just like you out there, Duke, where do you go to stay up to date with your MMA news? And and, and who do you watch? Who do you pay attention to? And it's it's such a good question that I said, you know something? Rather than just throw a name out there, let me reach out and, and, and get one of my favorites on the show to give you some information directly from the source and let you know about their career and what have you. So... Without further ado, welcome to the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast. We are talking about somebody that is legitimately just a big ball of energy, Miss Susan Singari. How are you, Susan? Hey, thank you so much, Duke, and what a great intro. You're making me blush over the phone over here, over the over the airwaves. Thank you so much for that kind and beautiful introduction. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something else because... Your show on YouTube, uh, Must Love MMA, is just so well done. I mean, first and foremost, from and, and I'm a nerd with this stuff. From a production standpoint, you, you just you do a great job, and, and it has the right type of graphics and what have you in there. But also the 
interviews. They're so interesting and so strong. You cover MMA in a manner that definitely is, is more reminiscent of a, a, a news magazine, a TV news magazine point mm-hmm. of view, which is just something that's so refreshing, and, and it's, it's great to see. Talk to us about that show, uh, Must Love MMA. Well, you know, it's funny. I don't really know how to do it any other way, Duke, because I come from a broadcast television news background. And when you work in broadcast TV news and you you work for regular shows, regular broadcast shows, not on the Internet, you really have to think about the the production value is so much different. So uh, we were taught that you can't write to video unless you have the pictures. So the classic example is, because I worked years in television news, is you don't put somebody on a live shot, so to speak, when you watch your local news. You would never go to somebody to talk about a burning building in a live shot where they say, hey, guess what, behind me is XYZ building burning. You don't go to the live shot unless you have the pictures to go with the video. So it actually takes me a lot longer than most people to probably do my interviews because I cover every single thing I can find with video. And I actually go ahead of time looking for little tidbits on Instagram and and dig deep within YouTube to find that one little nugget that will make the person stand out as an individual. When I first started working in MMA, which was about seven years ago as a part-time person, and I took the leap from leaving regular broadcast stuff, working for Entertainment Tonight and Fox News Channel, you know, all my friends were like, MMA is a bunch of tattooed animals, so to speak. My mother, uh, a Bostonian like yourself, was like, what are you going to do? You're going to go down to a gym with these with these people? So I really wanted to make people understand, and that's the tagline, that every fighter has a story. There are not these tattoo sort of lower class people that seven years ago many of the people thought they were. I mean, we know that Chuck Liddell, if I'm not mistaken, has an accounting degree. Han Ghazali is a well-known person in Israel. We'll be interviewing her first in a few in a few days, actually, for his fight in November. He was a, he ran a security company. Not all these people are sort of the the impression that we saw. And actually, my impetus for this was, and I'm not sure which um, which which one it was, but it was um, Rashad versus Rampage. And they were against each other. And gosh, what is the name of that? Dana White's going to kill us. We can't remember the name of the reality show, but it's been off the air. Help me out here. I think you're talking about The Ultimate Fighter. Ultimate Fighter. Oh, my God. Sorry, Dana. Please don't ban me from all your, your, all your media in the future. Ultimate Fighter. <laughs> yeah, because you know that's not very cool. It just hasn't been on this year, and so I haven't watched it. We miss it. Um, but Ultimate Fighter was on, and it was Rashad versus Rampage. And I was struck by the drastic comparison between them. You had good cop, bad cop. And I didn't know Rampage. I didn't know anything about him. But Rashad was this sort of classy sort of good cop, and Rampage was this classy sort of non-existent rather bad cop. And I just knew in my heart that there was something else going on. So I pursued that, and I really try, and I really want people to understand that every fighter does have a story. And, and when under that banner, it's a promoter, it's a it's a trainer. I mean, these guys and gals work so hard, as you know, Duke. They don't really, not all of them succeed at the top. Many, many of them are working two jobs, training at night. Julian Lane, is. we have an interview with him coming up. He's working out like a maniac for Bare Knuckle FC. Uh, they, just, they just work so hard. And I wanted people to understand that they're doing it for the love of the sport, which to me is the most refreshing and most wonderful experience. Having come from interviewing some baseball people, which we can't really talk about on the air because I'll be banned from baseball, some other, some, other, some other sports people that were not as gracious about their interviews. And as you know, the MMA community, the bare knuckle community, is just the people in it are just so wonderful. Everybody I meet, you know, late at night when I'm working, you know, no sleep at all, I'll get a tw- Twitter, somebody will say something on tweet, Twitter that says, you know, we like your interviews, and I go, oh, my God, I don't need sleep. I just need to keep on working because these are the people that love me, so i got to keep on going. So I'm super passionate about it, 
And I, I just can't say enough about how grateful, really, and honored I am to be a part of it because uh, I don't know what I'd be doing. It's sort of like a second life career for me. If I didn't have combat sports, I don't, I'm not sure what I'd be doing. I'd probably be really bored and I'm not one to shop or uh, I don't know. I just don't know. So it kind of reinvented myself with it. And I'm just so grateful and honored, as I said, to be to be able to be a part of the community. Well, and, and it's it's pretty unusual um, for somebody with your vast experience. And I know we're, we're definitely going to dig into that, but like you said, you 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 come from the the news world where you you've covered world events and other things. You you produced major shows on major networks and what have you. For you to just completely switch and go to <laughs> mixed martial arts seven years ago, and and folks, let me let me paint a quick picture here because I know here in Boston, our Boston City Council were literally fighting on the floor about whether or not to sanction, to allow mixed martial arts to happen in the city of Boston. And UFC in particular at the time, were, were, they were trying to get their events. They were trying to make it possible to host an event in Boston for the first time. And the president of the city council at the time, Steve Murphy, who, you know, he's a friend of mine, actually, he was very direct about the fact that he felt there was human cockfighting and there was no way it was ever going to happen in Boston and blah, 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 and all this good stuff here. That's that was the attitude just seven years ago in a major city huh. like Boston. So to see where we're at today, where you absolutely have seen UFC here in Boston and, and other types of mixed martial arts all over the, the world, it's just interesting the fact that you made that switch at that time period, which was such a pivotal time period around the nation, uh, because attitudes were still kind of going the other way. Right, so it right. Was slightly, it was slowly shifting. So that was a leap of faith that you took there. Well, it was not only a leap of faith. The whole way I got into mixed martial arts was a mistake. I mean, it's the most bizarre story. I was doing, I can't remember if it was for NBC Sports or, or, or uh, I don't remember which broadcast it was for. I was scheduled to do an interview with a woman who was based in South Florida, and she was a wrestler, a female wrestler. And we were supposed to do her interview on a Monday. And, you know, we had hair and makeup, which is a big thing, and a two-camera shoot, which is a lot of money. And at the last minute, her coach, which was her main coach, decided not to do the interview. I don't remember why because it was a long time ago. But her strength and conditioning coach was a gentleman by the name of J.C. Santana, who runs an organization called the International Health and Performance Fitness Institute of Training here in Boca Raton, Florida. And this guy was on the cutting edge way before anybody else was because he was a trainer's trainer. At the time, he had already trained all these mixed martial arts guys. In fact, at one point, Peter Belfort went back to him for strength and conditioning coach coaching down here, somewhere in between his switch from leaving the former Black Zillions to opening up his own gym. And Jason Santana was flying in on a Sunday night to do the interview from Chicago. And I called him, and he was getting on the plane. I said, J.C., I, I, you know, I don't have an interview for you tomorrow. Uh, he said, well, I'm already on the plane. I'm coming back just for you. And I said, what can I do to make it up to you? And he said, you can do an interview on MMA. I was like, what the F is MMA? No clue. Absolutely no clue. Didn't know what it stood for. Didn't even know what it was about. And I interviewed Cole Miller. And Micah Miller, and it was a story in Micah Miller. It's somewhere in uh, my YouTube channel really far back. And I remember standing in American Top Team, which is where they trade, saying, when Micah Miller's not pounding and grounding, or was it grounding and pounding? I didn't even know the words to the stand-up, which is a portion we do online, you know, a portion we do on camera. And Cole tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, it's grounding and pounding. I'm like, oh, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> they didn't want to let them know. I didn't know the first thing about it. I sent the script over to J.C. Santana who helped me write it. I didn't know anything about strength and conditioning, but I was just fascinated with the sport. I was fascinated with the work ethic. And as I mentioned earlier, I was just intrigued by the fact that these people were really working as opposed to so many other sporting uh, athletes that I covered. They were really working on getting a lot of money. And I thought, you know, I've got to check this out. Then I was up doing an interview somewhere along the way and ended up breaking my arm, I think. I was up uh, doing the space shuttle launch. In fact, I got to meet Walter Cronkite for Entertainment Tonight. It was the anniversary space shuttle launch. 
and I think I, I forget what happened, but I wound up falling off a riser. I, I had a little, little fracture in my right hand, and I was stuck at home, and I couldn't really do anything. I couldn't write. At that time, they didn't have voice to text like we had because it was so far back, and I started watching The Ultimate Fighter, and as they say, the rest is history. I was hook, line, and sinker, and, and still am. I'm just... Never got over the sport. The passion is still there. And you know one of the things, too, that really still I, I can't explain to people that so uh, just just hugs my heart. I love the fact that the fighters honor each other. And most of them, 99% of them, will hug each other after the fight. It still is something to me that is so near and dear to my heart because I feel like, hmm, they've got respect. And as I said, you know, I've covered a couple Super Bowls and, used to cover spring training down here for Fox News Channel before they had Fox Sports. Some of the fighters that are, excuse me, some of the athletes and other, and some of the other sports are just not as appreciative as the interviews. And I, I just, you know, the MMA community just, I just bullied my way in, so to speak. You know, in Spanish we say down here, you got, you got balls, which is cojones, and I'm not going to take no for an answer. Uh, and uh, that's just my personality, and I just kind of kind of got lucky because American Top Team is close to here, uh, and the fighters were accessible, and I think they felt sorry for me to tell you the truth because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I really didn't, but I spent a lot of time watching fights by myself, and I would turn the, the, the uh, you know, Joe Rogan off, and I would try to listen to what he was saying, and I would try to learn all the words. I remember first time I, and every time in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as you know, there's something you never can learn. Like, I didn't know what a Peruvian necktie was. I'm still not sure I know what it is. So it's a constant learning experience for me, and I I just never get bored with it. I just never, I I just can't explain it. So, there you go. (laughs) A heck of a story, and and again, it's it's so interesting, because what did your friends and colleagues from the regular news world how did they take you saying, hey, guys, I'm going to leave this thing, Entertainment Tonight, Fox News, you know, covering sports for them, producing this show and that show. I'm going to leave that stuff, and I'm going to focus on MMA right now. How did, how did the, the other folks react to that? They thought it was effing crazy. They didn't, you know, still to this day, one of my very dear friends was like, you know what, I never believed you, but you finally made it. They just thought it was crazy. I was burned out on covering news anyway. I had done so many stories. You know, I'm very proud of my involvement with a show called America's Most Wanted. Uh, the show worked. But when you're on stories like 9-11 or uh, bombs that are exploding up in discotheques up in Orlando with uh, you know, what we call spot news in the industry or show stories on Anna Nicole Smith, which I was on forever with Entertainment Tonight, and oodles of hurricanes I've hovered, covered, you really have to be much like a first responder. You're, you're on the clock. You're always ready to go. And I was really burnt out. I mean, I had had my joyride, so to speak. I, 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 I no longer felt the same passion for getting up in the middle of the night going to cover a hurricane. I had done it. So MMA kind of came along at the right time for me. I still do a lot of work for Entertainment Night. Some of the other shows I will will run out, you know, and do some interviews for. But I just don't have the same passion for it. I think that that level when you're doing what we call spot news and breaking news, as we call it, is probably better left to people who don't, uh, who are a little bit younger than me and still have that passion for it. And there's a lot of people in my industry that love it. I have a wonderful cameraman by the name of Tony Zambato who is a former Marine, and he was the camera person that broke the story uh, at Hurricane Katrina. You can look him up. He's the one that talked about the fact that people were living in their own disaster there at the, uh, I think it was the auditorium or whatever it was during Katrina, because I was actually covering Katrina down here. He was the first to report all the horrible things that were going on at, at, at Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. He still loves it. He still loves to get up in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning. For me, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm watching a post-fight UFC press conference. Give me more, baby. I'll stay up for that, but I don't want to get up at 3 o'clock and go cover a, a national disaster. I was just burnt out. Wow. And, and you know something? Who can't relate to that? Who can't relate to pouring your, your heart and soul into whatever career you have, and, and especially if it's something that you have some longevity within, you went to school for this thing, this is this has been your life for for a, a long period of time, 
and yeah, you get to the point where it's like, I need something new. I, I, I need yeah. excitement. I, I need to look at different faces. I need to, to find my passion again. So I, I totally understand what you're saying there. Let me ask you a question. Well, first and foremost, you, you mentioned um, Spanish. Are, are, are you Latina? No, I'm not. And for the Spanish people in the audience, I always say the following. Mi cuerpo está italiano, which means my body is Italian. Mi corazón está latina, which means my heart is Latin. And mi cabeza está loca, which means my head is crazy. I'm a wannabe Spanish gringa. I love the language. I am. I just love the people. I love the culture. I actually went down to Univision in Telemundo and applied as a reporter. But when it's not your first language and you're working in live television, you're a step behind. And so practice as I might, my Spanish is not grammatically correct. Um, but I, it was the time I worked for people in Espanol and was able to work with them every Saturday. And, you know, it's just like anything else. Just like people tell me they don't like to do on-camera interviews or they may have a problem doing audio interviews or they may have a fear of public speaking. The more you do something, the more you conquer your fears, the better you are. So uh, the more I was able to speak it, the better I got. And being down in Miami, of course, it's really hard not to be able to speak the language. So... But I'm not grammatically correct on it. And um, I would love to have been able to work for Univision and Telemundo. But that mere second is a big difference if you're doing broadcast news. It shows. <laughs> and my last name for those in real Spanish in Cuba and in Mexico, my last name means a very bad swear word, chingar. And I don't know if I can even tell you online or on the, on, rather on air what that means. So your viewers can go look that up because chingar is like, it's, I can't say it. It's, it's a terrible word. But some of your viewers will have a laugh on it because it's a very bad, uh, it's a very bad swear word. And it's actually, I guess I could say it, it means two F-U-C-K in oh, those no. two countries. The rest, the rest of the world, it means everything positive. But in Cuba, and in Mexico, it's considered a swear word. So whenever I go down to Miami, I have to pre-qualify myself and say in Spanish, si yo significa que mi nombre, uh, yo sé que no, what que significa mi nombre es, which is like, I know what my name means. And then I'll go into this long practice speech about how it's really not the reason why I'm using that name is to get an interview. It's really my real name in, in a time. It means gypsy, which is what I am. That's that's a heck of a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I, what I was going to ask you though is, is is as a woman who is literally you're you're all in on this these interviews. You do a lot of these live interviews and what have you taped interviews. Um, what are the differences? What are the differences for you that you've experienced in MMA as opposed to? doing, you know, the regular news. Are you are are you treated the same way? Is there any difference in, in access or things of that nature there? No, I would say the MMA community is different and special in that way. You know, they're very much there's no egos involved in MMA and I think what's important to convey to any audience is mixed martial arts is about the martial arts philosophy. So there really there's really no egos in it. I mean I can <clears throat> say that I have had various issues, uh, not issues, but there's been sexual discrimination. I was one of the first people in the locker room reporting uh, in Denver and in, in football, and I've covered spring training. The Yankees were not so easy to get along with. I, I don't want to trash anybody, but they were tough in spring training uh, when I was young. I took it all in good humor because – Back when I was covering sports, and actually, I, I you know, I started as an intern at WBZ with Bobby Lobel, which will te technically date every, me to all the viewers that are really looking things up. There weren't a lot of women in it, and I had wanted to be in sports full time, but it really wasn't uh, anything that you could kind of break the glass ceiling. I think as as we see moving forward, we see more women in it. But no, the MMA community has been really cool. I don't know if it's because maybe I'm just they feel sorry for me because I didn't, as I said, I really didn't know what I was doing. But, I mean, I just I just have really been accepted. I can remember some of the people I've interviewed, I had no idea who they were. Last week, Mark Godbeer, and I do want to talk about this, they're going to ask me about this anyway, I really didn't know who he was. 
you know, and I have such a fangirl crush on him now because he's such a great athlete. You know, I, when I say a fangirl, it's not that I want to have, I'm not interested in him. I don't, I don't, I'm not, he has a lovely wife and three children and during our post, in one of our post fight interviews with Valor BK, he talked about bringing a pony back to his, his, um, his, his daughter. But I didn't really know who he was beforehand. And now when I, I see who he is and I think to myself, gosh, we did interviews with him and I reached out to him to do a post fight for knuckle interview. I go, wow, he's a great big fighter. And I didn't know who he was. And he's accessible. And he's willing to do an interview. And I, I thank Valor BK, by the way, because I feel like they brought so many different styles of fighting and so many people that I didn't know about that kind of were up the line for bare knuckle. I mean, Ishii coming back was, a, was huge, and I think J.C. Lam is coming in, and, and Stefan Payan, you know, he's had some bare knuckle before he was on um, David Feldman's card, but there were a lot of fighters that I didn't know about. I didn't know who Mo was. I, I didn't know, but yet they're available to you. I just think it's a different sport with a different mentality. I mean, I, I still have to tell fans, though, this. I Also, before Mark Godbeer, I had a super huge fan, and I still have a super huge fan girl crush on Rashad Evans. And I was very nervous. I met him because he's, you know, he's the guy that got me into into um into fighting. And I remember I he's an African American man, and I'm a white person. And and so I I met him at a, at a local fight, and I wanted to take a photo. And I was so nervous. My palms were sweaty. I didn't know how to use my mobile phone. I was like, Oh my God! He, there's Rashad. It's Rashad. It's Rashad. I have to take a picture. And he said he'd take a picture. And I couldn't get the flash work. It was everything you would expect from fangirl. It was not journalist. So finally he says to me, give me that phone. I go, why? He goes, because I'm an African-American man, and you're a white woman, and we need a flash. And bam, we took the phone. <laughs> and now, now my fear is over. And, it, you know, it's the worst photo of me because I look like I had this horrible outfit. It's like a leopard skin dress. Like, what was I thinking? I look awful in it. But there's the photo with her shot. So now nothing matters. But he's, I call it, gives me the tingles. I will always run up to him now when I see him. I go, you're the guy that gives me the tingles. And it's not... Again, I don't want the viewers. I'm not being disrespectful. He's a happily married man. No disrespect to his lovely wife and his lovely daughter, who we see down quite a bit at 365 Hard Knocks. It's, you know, I'm a journalist, but just like everybody else, damn it, I'm a fan. And I'm just a fangirl with a clipboard that gets to ask the questions. And, you know, I respect that. And I, I'm just, as I said, I'm just... I'm just honored to be a part of it. I just can't say enough about the sport. The people are accessible. And, you know, I think you'll find that if, if, if fans want to go down to a gym, they can go down. They're not going to be – it's not closed. You know, I don't know about – I know that um, – and, in fact, I hope to be doing an interview with him very soon. Gabriel Gonzaga has two gyms in the Boston area. I bet if fans go over to Gonzaga BJJ, they can walk in and they can see the fighters training. Because the American top team in 365 Hard Knocks down here in South Florida and MMA Masters, you can walk in and you can see you can see the people. Now, should the fan go up and ask, the you know, barge in and ask for an interview right away? No, but in the proper setting, maybe coming out, Maybe there's a chance to ask them the question. I mean, they, they're they're very giving to to the fans. I think that the fighters really in this sport and in bare knuckle, which I love dearly as well. I think they value and understand that they're fighting for the fans, and the fans are part of the mix, and they're non-union, of course. So they understand the fact that you know uh, fans are what make them, and and you know they're accessible. You can you can find them at the gyms. I don't know what it's like all over the place. I may have. Now, of course, now there's a horde of people going to probably be stalking all the fighters. I didn't mean to do that. Be respectful, fans. These guys are busy. <laughs> We're talking to Susan Singari of Must Love MMA. You brought it up, so I, I got to jump right into this here. Bare knuckle fighting. And, and, and let me go back. I'd say about right around six or seven years ago, I noticed that uh, Hall of Fame legend Ken Shamrock, he was he was talking about the desire to start a bare knuckle fighting promotion and, and how bare knuckle was really the purest form of MMA and you know get rid of the gloves and and, and the skill is different and it would be something that he felt would, would really catch on. Fast forward now to this year where he and his partners got everything together and, and, and as you pointed out got their fighters together. And they put on this, this Valor Bare Knuckle company in, in their first event, Valor Bare Knuckle 1. 
tell us about your impression overall of the event, uh, who, and, and especially someone like yourself who you've studied MMA, you've interviewed so many different people, and, and you, you're passionate not only about MMA but bare knuckle fighting. What did you think of the presentation that Valor Bare Knuckle provided? I loved it. I thought it was amazing. I love the pit. I love that idea of an open sort of arena there. Uh, I love the fights. I thought they were really interesting. I think the pit itself, you know, I wasn't sure what it looked like till we saw it. I didn't have any, any pre information on it myself. I saw it just as the fans saw it the night before we had a picture of it. I thought at first it looked like a donut. So I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work out. But I thought the pit was really interesting. And I thought the fights were really interesting. Um, you know, I just think it's it's just a one punch knockout thing. And as God Beer mentioned in one of the interviews we did with him ahead of time, you know, it's a different sport. And I'm now, you know, the same way I'm crazy about MMA, I'm even more crazy about bare knuckle because it is so pure and it is so, I guess, gritty and it is so just gloves off, you know. And, and so actually bare knuckle, as you know, came from England where there's quite a number of pr- promotions over there, including BKB16 and UBAT, that have been doing it for a while. And they have some terrific fighters over there. I like it because it reminds me of one of my other favorite fighters. I just like it because it reminds me of Michael Bisping. And Michael Bisping is kind of that in your face and Brad Pickett too. I don't give an F. I'm just going to, I'm just going to kick your butt, I'm just going to fight you, and I'm just going to win the fight. So I think it's, in, in effect, it's one of the purest forms of combat. It is different, though. I mean, when I covered Bare Knuckle FC7 uh, and Biloxi, a lot of the fighters, and this is Feldman's group, a lot of the fighters had injuries because the fights went on longer. The fights with Valor didn't go on as long because he had some really big heavyweight and, 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 and tournament people that had some very powerful punches. But some of the lighter weight fighters in some of the sports, like Jim Allers and, 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 um, especially the girls by Christine Feria, um, really, really hurt her, her hands very badly. And you'll see their knuckles will come out. Melvin Gillard, his hand, we did an after a fight interview. I thought, I could have sworn any moment he was going to have a compression fracture in his hand. His hand was so swollen after the fight. I went up to him, and I was like, well, Melvin, you promised me an interview, but we did do it. And he was in really bad pain, and props off to him because his hand was swollen. So the injuries are a little different. Personally, if I could do anything, if I could relive my life over, I would go back and do, I would be in boxing and bare knuckle. But it's just too damn expensive to get my face redone, so I gotta stick with reporting on it. But I like, I like boxing. I really like boxing. And, uh, a shout out to my coach friend, Billy Padden, who trains Greg Hardy, cause he promised me he'd train me in boxing silly style. I haven't made it down to the gym. Uh, it would be gloves on. But I like it. I really like it. I think it's a it's cool new sport. And I'm thrilled that Valor is over here. And I'm thrilled that Bare Knuckle FC is over here. And there was also um, another promotion with uh, Backyard Brawls, which started all down here. Actually, Jorge Masvidal and, um, Ho- and uh, Alex Cazares came with Dada 5000. And they were the original Backyard Brawls down here. There's a lot of video on them. Uh, and in Dada 5000, there's a new movie coming out that will kind of showcase that on, uh, uh, coming up on Net- Netflix. And you'll see that these backyard brawls, which he's a pioneer in, were really just two people kind of working their differences out because they just wanted to settle the score. And as we look back in history, that's kind of what James Sullivan was doing it. It was a gloves off gentleman's fight. They were just settling the score. So to me, it's a fascinating news but sport. One that, I, again, I'm honored to be involved in and one I will, I'm continuing to follow and um, learn new terminology because toe the line wasn't anything I heard before and some of the other words and uh, that go along with bare knuckle. It's a whole new, and it keeps me fresh, it's a whole new language I'm learning about the bare knuckle rules and the bare knuckle punches and the strategy that goes down with it. Well, and it's funny because I, I believe it was you, you had an interview with Ishe Smith after his fight uh, with Valor, and, and he said exactly what you just said. He talked about the fact that his knuckles were swollen. And right. here's a guy who is a boxer. You know, here's a guy who's a very experienced boxer, and, and he's, he's fought all over the place. 
for him to do this bare knuckle fighting. He said he enjoyed it. He said, but yeah, it's definitely different. My knuckles are, <laughs> are swollen. And, and he, he had a pretty, a, a fairly easy time during his fight with his, his skin, right. what have you there. But for a boxer to, to point that fact out and saying that when you wear gloves, you don't feel anything when you hit somebody. This yeah. bare knuckle stuff, you feel everything. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I didn't interview Beck Rawlings when she first started Bare Knuckle, and she was doing something called palming. I'd never heard of it. Um, and it's basically conditioning your hands for these blows. Uh, Stephen Pye, and we did a pre-interview with him. It's uh, somewhere on my YouTube channel as well. He was hitting, like, these these rails. I don't even know what they would be called. They were, like, metal rails to condition his hand. So it is a whole different, it is a whole different thing. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's different because with the gloves on, depending on the size of the gloves, you don't feel it. But as EJ pointed out, it is a, a much more, I think it's a much more dangerous sport in the fact that, you know, once you, once your hand is broken, um, and you know, Uriah Faber, who I love, broke his hand many years ago in a fight, kept on punching. It's painful. I mean, I can't imagine what the adrenaline's going through these people's heads. And many of the fighters in our fight at Bare Knuckle FC um, in Biloxi, many of the fighters, both male and female, broke their hands. They continued punching. So hats off to any of the fighters in Bare Knuckle because, you know, it's painful, as she said. It's a whole different sport. The injuries are, I think, much more quickly su- sustained because there is nothing to protect you. And you can get, you can get your, you know, you can get your face banged up a little bit more quickly and your hands. And the hands, I think, are the, the weapons you need. And if you've got a broken hand, God, I don't know how the heck they're fighting through it. But we see, we saw Uriah do it and we've seen many of the fighters just, you know, hats off to them, both the bare knuckle fighters and also, um, the, uh, the MMA fighters that punch their way through because, gosh, I don't know how they do it. It's got to be the adrenaline. <laughs> Folks, just listen to her talk, and, and you can see exactly why Susan Singari is, is legit. one of the main people that I go to to keep up to date with my MMA news, just because not only do, are you great at interviews, but you're great at explaining what, what's going on here, painting the picture even further. So it, it just, it's awesome. I want to ask you, because, again, you had this other career way before this, this MMA stuff. You've actually won various awards, including an Emmy. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about being an award-winning journalist and, and, and what have you here. Well, you know, I got into I got into television at a really young age. I'm probably the first time I'm ever going to reveal this, so you'll be the first one to hear it, because it will definitely reveal my true age, which I'm very sensitive about because this sport is all about young people. But I was a kid, and I would come from Connecticut, and I got to stay up late, and Eyewitness News was on the air. I think I was like 10 or 11, maybe I was 9, and I got to stay up late and watch Eyewitness News, which was a big local newscast in uh, the New York area. And Geraldo Rivera was doing a story on Willowbrook. I remember the nightgown I wore because it was the 11 o'clock news, and it was like, wow, I got to stay up. And he did a story about how these children at a state-run mental institution were sleeping in their own feces. And I was like, wow, I can change the world, too, and be just like him. I've actually had a chance to work next to him on various hurricanes along the way. And I still feel he's one of the most wonderful journalists because he was an investigative journalist. But I knew at, like, 9 or 10 that I wanted to be in television. And I think that gave me a head start because at 12, I talked my way into a radio show for the for the summer and I <laughs> I had to go back to school in the fall and I remember the the radio director saying to me what you're not really uh, you're not 16 and my mother used to drop me off way far away so I could walk over there but I just you know I've been in television news covering various stuff you know hurricanes and America's most wanted and trials the beauty of being a freelancer in Florida and working for so many different shows and also at the time uh, where so many of the sort of stories came out of. We had William Kennedy Smith, and we had Hurricanes, and we had every, basically, and sadly, or maybe not so sadly for my career as a freelancer, kind of every scandal, trial, hurricane, drama, kind of starts and ends in Florida. When Con Affair was in the mix, they had two bureaus, 
South Florida and Texas. And that was because so many of the stories that were sort of tabloid related came from here. So it was an opportunity for me to kind of adapt and change with different shows. And I've covered just about everything. I've covered, you know, entertainment because at one point South Florida was, had a, uh, tax thing where we had so many shows down here. We had movies. Um, we had, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name. Um, David Caruso, oh, you're going to hate me, David, I can't remember. The Forensic Files was down here. So many of the shows were down here. Bad Boys was down here. Tom Cruise did his rock star show down here. So we had a various amount of different shows. So I was never bored because I was always kind of in the mix. If I wasn't current, ready to cover a hurricane, I was chasing a criminal, America's Most Wanted. If I was working for Fox News Channel, I was covering a burning building or maybe, a, you know, something else. And then, of course... I worked a lot, and I did a lot of medical reporting for Fox. So I kind of had a very blessed career because I was never on the same story every day. So it kept me kind of on my toes and also the opportunity to really work with a lot of different people in a lot of different situations. Well, it, it, and it's interesting because, again, you, you had all of that variety, and, and you were gaining so much experience, and then you you – win an Emmy. I mean, legitimately, <laughs> your, your, your peers, you're being recognized as excellence in the field. How did that feel? How, how did it feel to, to, to gain that type of acknowledgement? Oh, it's always great to win an Emmy. I actually won my Emmys at a station in in Colorado. Um, you know, listen, those are just, it's like you're only as good as your last fight, Right. And you hear the fighters say that. You're only as good as your last broadcast. They mean really nothing to me. And, you know, people will say you've had such a storified and glorified career. You've interviewed this person and that person. At the end of the day, you're only as good as your last fight, your last interview, your last story, uh, your last, you know, your last you're last of everything. So to me, it's just, you know, it's great and it's wonderful. But, you know, behind every great reporter is a team of people. I don't do this alone. I have editors that edit my video, uh, and I love them. I have cameramen that, that, that are amazing. You know, one of the things that's, that's, that's different now as we move forward is that I came up at a time where there were people that you weren't a multimedia journalist. You didn't do everything. You know, you were, you had a camera person and you had a, an editor and you had, uh, an audio person with you. As things have progressed and as things are live on Facebook and things are live on YouTube, I've had to kind of relearn all the technical stuff over again. Uh, I did, by the way, and Props to you. I did try to audio edit. I don't know how you folks do it. Uh, I wanted to make my voice lower. I wanted to make it higher. I just gave up on it. Uh, so audio editing was never my thing. And I do know how to video edit quite a little bit. But I do have a team behind me. And, and I think uh, I, I think it's important to understand that behind most of your broadcast people, there are more than one person in the mix. And I, I'm so grateful to have those people, including my hair and makeup artists, who make me look young, thin, and tan. And that's a damn challenge as I get older in the industry. <laughs> well, listen, you, you definitely check all of those boxes very well, so whatever. You know, if, it, if it's a, an effort that is a team effort, then great job, everybody, including yourself, because it works. I, I can't imagine that your YouTube channel wouldn't be as, as popular as it is Unless you were looking as fabulous as you look all the time. So, oh, it takes, a, it takes a team for that. Believe me, it takes a makeup and hair team. No lies. <laughs> so, you're a renaissance woman. You, you, you've, like you said, you've done stuff with Fox News. You've done stuff with America's Most Wanted, Entertainment Tonight. you got the MMA thing going. What's next? And, and, and come on, you can, you can give us the inside scoop here. I will give you the inside scoop. Um, you know, it's funny because I look ahead and I say to myself, what am I going to do when I'm just too old and tired or fat to not be on camera anymore? And there's a time where that happens, you know. Not all of us can be beauty stars 10 years from now. I'm sticking with MMA and, and, and bare knuckle. I plan to 
this is it for me. Some people get divorced and, and, and get married. Some people have a change of life baby. I'm in this hook, line, and sinker. You know, folks, I do, and I want to share this. I offer free media training on Sunday to anybody in the combat sports industry, whether you're a trainer, whether you're an up-and-coming MMA or bare-knuckle fighter. This is my gift back, and you just have to find me on Skype at Susan Singari and follow me and DM me, and I'll do it. I would like to, moving forward, I'd like to, um, first off, I'd be honored if I could manage fighters. I don't know if I'm that qualified to do it. I think I can pick talent. Uh, but I'd like, I, I would be honored to be able to manage fighters. I'll definitely go into PR and marketing. As I mentioned, helping the fighters is important. You know, that we all can't be a Conor McGregor. We all can't be a Chael Sonnen. And I adore Chael, by the way. I think he's the bomb. And thank you so many times for your interviews. We can all be good on camera. And the person that has the most ability to mesmerize the audience, I think it's the fighter, it's the fighter or fighter that is a person that will continue to be loved. So I would like to go into managing or PR or both. Um, I'm sticking with the game for a long time. You know, I wouldn't mind moving forward to be involved in the promotion of this sport. Don't count me out a couple of years from now. You know, you'll see my name in, as a bare knuckle promoter. I'm not qualified for MMA, but bare knuckle is growing. And um, I do want to be involved in the sport. So kind of the sky's the limit for me. I just feel like I'm in it. I can't live without it. Uh, and I'm just going to continue with it. And again, I just want to say thanks to everybody in the fight community for allowing me to be a part of it. So, so tell everyone out there, please, if if they want to get more Susan Singari in their life, plug all <laughs> your stuff. How, how can they find your multitude of, of great things, including your awesome website, which – has your credentials, it talks about all the great people. You, you've interviewed presidents and athletes and everybody under the sun. Give everybody the information. How can they find Susan Singari up there? Well, I'm going to be honest. I monitor myself. I answer. Even though it could be 11 to 2 o'clock in the morning, you'll see me. I monitor my Twitter myself. So if you follow me at Susan Singari, you're going to hear from me. I also, that's at Susan Singari on Twitter, S-U-S-A-N-C-I-N-G-A-R-I. I also make a real effort to answer everybody personally on my YouTube channel, which is Susan Singari MMA. My Instagram is also Susan Singari MMA. We are not Facebookers. We can't be everywhere. We're trying. That's coming up. Uh, so if you catch me on my Facebook page, Must Love MMA, you may not hear right back from me right away. And then the website at www.mustlovemma.com, we do monitor that. Um, I do have an email where people can reach me as well. It's info at mustlovemma.com where we monitor that. But I'm pretty accessible. You know, I'm, I work like 18 hours a day. It's a labor of love. You can really find me if you really want to find me. You know, <laughs> I'm around. Her name is Susan Singari. Like I said, she is one of my go-to people for the, the latest in MMA news. Susan, can we have you back sometime in the future? You absolutely can, and I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of this. I had so much fun. I really did. I can't wait to do it again. Like I said, that, that Susan Singari, I mean, she is just so amazing. I mean, really someone who has had a stellar career She's worn so many different hats, you know, as a journalist and, and, and someone who's interviewed so many folks and producer, creator of content, just, and, and she doesn't stop, man. She, she continues to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. And, and one of the things that I like about Susan is that she understands when it's time to make changes. She doesn't stick around too long in any one place. She knows when it's time to, all right, we got to kick it to the next gear. We got to do this next thing. We got to do this next thing. And she's already thinking about what happens when she can't appear on camera as much anymore. You know, let's get back to focusing on some more behind the scenes stuff. So, you know, uh, audio stuff specifically, writing more, just, just really, she's a sharp one. She's a sharp one. So please, I hope everyone checks out her Must Love MMA website and the YouTube channel. Definitely check out Susan on, on Facebook and Twitter. The Twitter is definitely more active. And in the Instagram, uh, you'll get some good stuff out of that. So definitely check her out. Listen, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, 
I am going to dig right in. I'm going to talk about this Wednesday night war that's going on between WWE NXT and All Elite Wrestling, their dynamite program. Stay tuned. It's coming up next. Hi, this is Earl Oliver from Sully's Finish Wrestling. This is Raj Geary with WrestlingInc.com. This is Sean Reed, boxing writer and undercover low-key wrestling fan. And you're listening to Duke Love Wrestling. Woo! All right, your wait is over. We can just jump right into this this Wednesday night war. So again, every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're receiving two, not one, two pro wrestling programs going on at the same time. Right? We're talking about WWE NXT, two hours live, USA Network. And then we have All Elite Wrestling, their new show called Dynamite, which is on TNT. Once again, two hours live, TNT. All of it is 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I got to tell you, this this has been tremendous. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 24 hours uh, removed from what happened last night. And it was really historic and it was fun. You know, I believe that both companies did a great job. There are things that I liked and disliked from both both programs, but overall, I was I was happy. You know, it's, this is just the the wrestling fans win when we have stuff like this. We have companies pushing each other to put out their best efforts, so to speak. You know, and let me start off with AEW Dynamite because I, I just want to say in particular, I, I know a lot of folks are talking about the the television ratings and, and AEW actually. Allegedly, they they had more people watch their program than those who watched NXT, and there's a lot of celebration around that. You know, it, it, it's it's definitely a major win for them if that's true. Uh, allegedly, they they got about 1.4 million viewers or something like that, whereas NXT they had about 900,000 viewers. I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily true. You, you know that uh, if you listen to this show, and I've had different folks on, including Tony Maglio of The Rap, we've gone over the concept of television ratings and, and, and whether or not they're accurate, therefore how important are they really in the television industry. So who knows? Who knows what, what the truth is in that? I can tell you from experience talking to you, the listeners of Duke Loves Wrestling, and, and you know I call you my wrestling crew, a lot of you watched AEW live because it was something new, something fresh. Uh, you watched that live and you DVR'd NXT. And who knows when you're actually going to watch NXT. Uh, did, you, did you watch it directly after? You stayed up and do that? Or, or did you watch it the next day, two days later? Who knows? But that's important because that's going to affect the overall rating as well. I'm going to tell you right now, the majority of you who had intentions of watching both programs that's what you told me you told me you were going to watch the new thing live to see how it does and you'll go back to nxt and we know that nxt is being shown on the wwe network thursday right the next day which is today so i almost feel like nxt is set up to not necessarily deliver what some would say, oh, this is the best rating going on. There's, there's, there's some factors in there that can affect that. Uh, and, and we know, again, how accurate is this stuff? Who knows? Here's what I do know. WWE, when you watch NXT and you see the brands that are advertising during NXT, some top-notch brands. And we know that they're going to be making a lot of money, right? It's like $30 million a year or something like that. That's the value of the NXT program. I'm still waiting on the information on, on AEW Dynamite, how much money that's expected to take in each year, but we know that's what NXT is going to take in. That's a done deal, right? So this whole ratings thing, you know, just keep it in perspective, especially in, in terms of business. Now, again, I give AEW credit. They definitely, they were trending number one online. They were number one in Google searches. They kicked WWE NXT's butt in that regard 
it's fresh, it's new. So that doesn't necessarily surprise me, to be honest with you. I expected to see that. Um, I enjoyed some, some things with Dynamite. I enjoyed the commentary, number one. I thought Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone, they're just tremendous. Love those guys. They're the best. Soundtrack of my, my wrestling life. Excalibur, he held his own. He's definitely improving, which is great. Great to hear. The production, the production of, of AEW, you know, just the, 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 the visual aspect of everything was very, very good. It was, it was lit up. It was beautiful to see. Very, very nice. Whoever's the production folks, you're doing a great job. Keep that up, please. The referees did a great job. I enjoyed what they were doing. They didn't take away from the matches. I felt they enhanced the matches. But there were some things I didn't like. I felt they were a little short on in-ring wrestling content. Definitely felt they could have delivered more of that. I didn't like the fact that there was only one women's match. You know, that that didn't make any sense to me. It's, you have a two-hour program. You couldn't fit at least two women's matches in there? What's, what's going on here? But you're going to take women's wrestling seriously, though, right? And it's going to be equal, right? Stop that. So I was a little disappointed in that. Uh, I... I didn't like all the, the interference going on in the matches as well. I, I felt that we should have had more straight matches that you just, you know, definitive. All this other extra hokey stuff didn't make any sense to me. For instance, in, in the main event, Johnny Moxley, the, the former Dean Ambrose, he attacked Kenny Omega. That should have been an automatic disqualification. Should have been an automatic disqualification, and that was not the case, which I was very disappointed about. Okay, so... Whatever. I think the, these are things that can be solved. I just hope that AEW gets to a place where they're delivering what they're marketing. Specifically, we need more women's content. And we need it on the television program every week. So that's number one. And number two, I want to see some, some men of color in one of the top six positions challenging battling for the AEW championship. We still don't see that. Cody Rhodes is the number one contender now. Oh, great. Okay. I don't even know how that happened. Whatever. We still don't see this this thing here. And again, they're supposed to be this diverse company. Where was Sonny Kiss last night? I don't know. I don't know. So, some things they can work on, and it can be fixed. It's not the end of the world yet. It can be solved, but... I don't know what you're waiting for, AEW. Just come on, you know? Make your wrestling content and deliver on what you market to the degree that your commentary, that your referee work, that your production value is. Because all that stuff is top-notch. It's whoever's building everything else. They don't, they're not making any sense. I don't know what you're doing with Ny Nyla Rose. You, you buried her, which is silly. So that's a whole other story. But overall, though, I, I think that um, for startup, they did a great job and they have a bright future. They just need to make some major adjustments here and don't wait. Let's let's just do it now. Do it now. So moving on to NXT, I really enjoyed that program. I thought that was just top notch as NXT traditionally is. I can tell you I'm watching the beginning of the of the show and what do i see i see a wrestling match and i don't see a lot of a lot of fluff a lot of a lot of wasted time they just jump right into it and it's the, and it's the championship match nxt championship so you're talking about adam cole and the bro they just they get in the ring and they just get it going and it was a great match you know matt riddle really showed some stuff there and comparing that to Sammy Guevara and, and Cody Rhodes, Sammy comes out with a, with a panda on his head. I mean, I don't know what the hell that was. It was just hard for me to, to compare the two and not feel that NXT was a heck of a lot more serious because they were giving me solid wrestling content. And one of the things that I noticed as well is that there was more wrestling content. The actual wrestling was happening for a longer period of time in the ring. They had two women's matches, and they were bust-ass good matches. 
I'm a little disappointed that the women didn't close the show. I, I, I did feel that the NXT Women's Championship should have been the main event. But I will say that that tag team match that was the main event was a damn good match in its own right. Street Profits versus Undisputed Era. That, that was just, <laughs> I mean, damn, you know, that was good. Good stuff, man. So, again, I, I, I didn't like... I feel like the women should have still gone last. I feel like that should have been the main event. That would have been a great statement to make. And those ladies had a great match anyway. Shayna Baszler, she took on Candice LeRae, and, and Baszler ended up winning in the end. But it, was, it told a good story. It was a great match, and just, I enjoyed it. It's good stuff. You know, and, and Io Shirai, she took on uh, Mia Yim, and those two had a damn good match too. Mia Yim is back, because her last outing before this was not very good, and she completely flipped that around and, and turned out a, a Mia Yim performance, which was very refreshing to see. So, you know, NXT is NXT, man. They're, they're the best, they're probably the best wrestling content you're going to see anywhere. Just really, really solid wrestling content. Not a lot of fluff. Not a lot of, you know, silly backstage skit storyline crap. Just they're giving you solid wrestling. Uh, some folks were complaining that they felt that it was a little too dark. And I don't necessarily disagree. I, I, they could they could add some more lighting to the mix just, just to see the crowd a little better, see the ring a little better. But you know, that's a style thing. Some people like the dark, block out the crowd a little bit, focus a little bit more on the ring. Who knows? I, I, I like the, the, the atmosphere. I can go either way, but I do like the NXT atmosphere. It is pretty cool. Old school style, you know. I feel like NXT won that 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 uh, battle last night. They delivered much better wrestling content, which they should. That's not a surprise. And I don't think anyone should rest on their laurels in that regard. They should. They've been around longer. They're more established. It's going to be interesting to see what AEW does going forward because I don't know. I don't know if you're going to maintain everyone's interest when that's the best you can do with your wrestling content. You got to do better. You know? NXT, they just got to stay the course. Plain and simple. They just got to stay the course. And I'm pretty sure that's exactly what the plan is. So, overall, though, I was very happy, very satisfied. Raw was amazing, too. Uh, Monday Night Raw, I mean, Bobby Lashley comes out with Lana to end the night with Rusev standing in the ring, and Lashley and Lana are making out. And a lot of folks were upset about that. You know, that got over a million views in less than nine hours. So, take that. <laughs> it's like the 24-7 championship all over again. It's like, dude, whatever generates the interest, you know, within a PG environment, mind you, just get it done. I'm with it. So... You know, Bobby Lashley's Mr. Steal Your Girl. It's the way it is, Jack. <laughs> that was pretty crazy, you know? And it's interesting because, folks, you know that this show comes out on Thursday, which means that you're going to have to wait a week for my SmackDown review because SmackDown will now be on Friday. And The Rock is going to be on SmackDown coming up. So that'll be, it's going to be crazy. SmackDown on Fox. So, overall, it is great to be a wrestling fan. Next week, the NWA, they're airing their own program, which is going to be on YouTube and Facebook. It's going to be on Facebook as well, which is pretty crazy. 6.05 Eastern Standard Time, 6.05 p.m. So, that'll be fun. I've already seen some things that are happening. The Rock and Roll Express, they won the Tag Team Championships for like the eighth or ninth time. That's pretty awesome. Thunder Rosa, she's in there. She attacked the NWA Women's Champion, Allison K. It's pretty awesome. So th there's a lot of cool things going on with the NWA as well. And you know, WoW Superheroes and New Japan Pro Wrestling, they're on Access TV Saturday nights. It's pretty cool. Impact, they're on Tuesdays. I was a little disappointed with you, Impact. They, they showed a, 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 a pay-per-view. They showed a pay-per-view from earlier this year, from January. That was their first show on Access TV. They're building up to their major debut, or I guess they're going to get it right, which is going to be later in, in October, but goodness gracious. Some of those people on, on that pay-per-view are not even in the company anymore. Come on. What, what, are, what are we doing? 
impact. Stop that. Just just show the, the, the past few weeks of impact wrestling television so everybody can get caught up. Don't you don't have to it's not rocket science. Come on. What are you doing? I, but they'll get it together. I, I have faith. I, I I think Impact is going to be a major player in this this uh, wrestling war that we have going on overall. I think they're going to turn some heads, man. I really do. I really do. So overall, it's a great time to be a wrestling fan. If you're a wrestling fan in 2019, it is like being back. I, I feel like we've been transported back to 1986, 1987, when wrestling was on every day of the week and that's the way it is now on on network television it's just it's awesome so congratulations to everybody once again AEW I'm proud of you just please make make those adjustments that's all I ask just make those adjustments but I'm proud of you and like I told you folks those those fake accounts of course they were talking trash to me during AEW the whole time go to the Duke Loves Wrestling uh, Twitter page you'll see it clear as day they were running their mouth whatever Twitter finger warriors it probably Cody and his in his crew allegedly that's what I'm saying it's got to be aew uh, uh, employee or somebody affiliated with them just can't get enough they got to come after the Duke whenever they have something going on whatever it is what it is but I still say uh NXT had the had the best wrestling program of that whole Wednesday night deal there, but I digress. Anyway, folks, listen, I want to thank my guests for joining us this week. Steffi Slays, Susan Singari. Oh, she's fantastic. Next week, I got some great guests lined up as well. This, (laughs) this, this train doesn't stop, man. I'm telling you, we just, we're, we're going to keep this going, bringing you the best content possible interviews that you won't hear anywhere else information you won't hear anywhere else that's what it's all about here on the duke loves wrestling podcast so listen i'm signing off now join us next week until then be kind to yourselves be kind to others and i'm gonna let my man one of the voices of aew mr tony shivani take us away bye bye everybody Mr. Tony Schiavone, and we're desperately out of time on Duke Love Wrestling.